So thanks for being here, third day of the conference, so it's good that you're all still awake. I'd like to start with a quick survey. So I think you all use Python, so who uses Go at the moment? Okay, um, Python. Okay, few people, C or C++? Okay. So, because I must admit, so the official title is Golang to Python. The unofficial title is use as many programming languages as you can for one particular project. And that's basically what you'll see in the next couple of minutes. So, first of all, why do, am I doing this? I have this little Hobart hobby project. So I want to basically rebuild one of my favorite applications, which is a regular expression tester. And I do the user interface with Python. It's pretty nice. It's, has all the good um, QT bindings that I need. But to have, let's say, more options available for the backend, I'd like to have slightly better performance, better concurrency or parallelism support. So I wondered which language might I use there. And after some trials, so I looked into C++ first, I ended up with Go. Because Go is quite a nice, let's say, middle ground if you go from Python to a completely compiled language like C++ or Rust. You still have your garbage collector, so you have automated memory management. You do have, well, a good, nice standard library. You have a quick compiler, which means that you don't really have to wait much if you just want to try little things. So it's good documentation, it has good IDE support, so it's a pretty nice language. It's not the perfect language, not by far, but I think it's mostly good. So. If you compare it to Rust and C++, and in recent days we had these talks about how to integrate these languages with Python, they will, in general, be faster than Go. They will allow you to do more things than Go, but they are also, well, let's say, more initial investment, more efforts than Go. To a certain extent, I'd like to say always mo more fraction. Whereas with Go, like with Python, I can sit down, think about the problems that I want to address, and say, okay, that's maps pretty straightforward to this particular language concepts. And I don't have to think about memory, um, memory management or, well, the borrow checker or any other implementation specific things. So before we go into the scene, one warning. Um, has anybody seen these particular pictures before? If you find them, the name is Rube Goldberg device. He did some illustration like that. That's the self-operator napkin. And the idea is just when you eat, eat something, you want to wipe your mouth afterwards. In order to do this, you can just tuck on the spoons and activate this bird somehow, then this clock, then this little rocket up and to the upper right, and afterwards it wipes your mouth. So it works, but it's amazingly complicated. And you might somehow wonder, doesn't it get slightly easier? To a certain extent, this is this talk, because, well, admittedly, at the last slides you will see, things can get slightly complicated. So what I'm going to do is basically give you a quick overview on how things work. We look into four different scenarios, wrapping simple function, wrapping objects, then more complex input-output parameters, and finally callback functions. You will see a lot of code, basically all the code that is necessary. And given the time, you will see it rather quickly. So if you have any questions afterwards, look at the slides. They will be uploaded. If you have still questions, email me. It will most likely take a week or two before I upload the code to GitHub, because, because I have to do some cleaning up to do before. But I'm always open for comments. That said, starting with the basics. Remember, my little desktop application, I wanted to do something, so Python works with Go, multiple options. You could go the RPC route, so you could use something like Google RPC with protocol buffers and basically run two processes to communicate over, well, a socket, local domain socket, or a, lo uh, a local host interface. I didn't really want to do it because I wanted to share the object model that I have in Go. And I also wanted to have a Python extension. So I didn't want to start two different processes. I just wanted one process to run with well, all my little Golang sweats and Go routines in there. So I decided to go for bindings. There is already a binding that allows you to even generate um, Python bindings from Go. It's GoPy. It is currently under active development. But as I last checked last week, they still have an issue that they um, 
have not implemented the pointer sharing rules that were introduced when I think Go 1.6 came out. So it's getting there, it's not completely complete, and so I decided, well, I have an excuse to do it on my own. So I did. And the tool that comes is CGO. CGO is part of the standard Go distribution that allows you to mostly do two things. First of all, well, it integrates C code with Go, as the name kind of implies. So with CGO, you can call existing C code, which I think is the main purpose, but you can also export your Go code as a C library, which is slightly, well, less used. It is not too complex to do this, but you have to be aware that there are a couple of limitations. So as soon as your pro Go program becomes a C Go program, compilation speed goes down because now you have not only to compile Go, you have also to have to compile C. The build process can get more complex, so you start seeing header files, both imported and exported ones. And also, since Go offers us so many nice things, Go routines, garbage management, etc., you have to somehow integrate these two worlds. So Go has different calling conventions than C. Go uses threads, but um, schedules its Go routines on these threads. And all these things have to be somehow moderated. C Go does that for you, but it comes with a cost, and this cost is in performance. So one of the questions is always, especially calling Go code from C, which also means Python to C to Go, how good is the performance? That's something we'll look into at the end of this talk. Okay. So before we go into the architecture, any questions so far? Okay. So if I'm going too fast, it's always fine to interrupt since most of these things build on, well, the slides before. High-level architecture. So I would like, basically, to call Go code from Python. Unfortunately, it is not quite as simple. So we have Go as a basis. So let's assume that we have written some nice Go code. It's not specifically for Python. I don't want to write a C Go code, because I like my Go tooling, fast compilation speeds, etc. So first of all, I need a first layer that exposes my Go code in C Go, which, well, basically gives us a C API and also provides C data types. Once we've done this, we want to use this in Python. And now there would be two ways. Either use the Python C API and write it myself, I use something existing, and I use Zeisen. So we export an API via the Seago, and we use this API via Zeisen, and we are back in Python land. And things are nice. It's a simple scenario. If things get slightly more complex, so if you want to share objects and have to ch make sure that the garbage collector doesn't steal them, but you still want to use them in Python, and if you want to pass along more complex data structures than, let's say, integers and um, strings, you need some support. So we also will see two areas of support code, one in Go and one in C++. C++. And now you remember why I brought in this Rube Goldblatt machine. The build process, so making this thing work, well, looks like this. So as my first step, I do a go build command that takes my Go files, the also C Go files, so these are also Go files in terms of how the build system treats them, and potentially my C, C++ support files, and builds um, a C library, in this particular case, an archive file, plus a header file. So I have a C library. And the second step um, takes the C library, uses it with Sizem, and I hopefully have my extension module. Okay, now let's make this slightly more practical. What we want to do as first step is just to wrap a very simple Go function. So we just want to add two integers. 
Then we want to make this function available, wrap it in Cython, and then finally use it from Python. So that's all. For those of the, you who haven't seen Go before, it should be pretty straightforward what happens here. So we have an add function. It's uppercase A, so the function would be exported from the Go module, uh, from the Go package where it is defined. We have two input parameters, both integers, and we return another integer, and they are just getting summed up. So it's, well, ultimately one liner. Now, the C Go code looks like this. Um, wherever possible, I wanted to, things, to make things as explicit as possible, so I defined all variables by hand. You could make this shorter, but the overall pattern is mostly the same. So, first of all, you tell C Go that you want to export this function to the resulting C library. Then you define your new parameters. If you have Cgo available, you have access to some C data types. That's this T, um, C dot that you see um, in the first line, so C dot int. And then I have always, when I wrap this function, to do basically three things. Take my parameters, convert them into the format that Go understands. It's basically the same format, and it's just for form's sake. Then do the actual work, call the function. That's where this var result int um, is called in the um, package main lib symbol. Then do another type conversion back and return it. And then I have this particularly uh, a build line. And if you look at this build line, you'll see, well, it's not still on GitHub because it's all, well, slightly crummy right now. But I just tell them that I'd like to have this particular C library built in a particular C um, build mode for Go and it appears on my file system, actually two files, the header file and the .r file, the archive file. The Golang generated header file is quite long, so if you cannot read the part on the left, you don't miss much. It's mostly type declarations in Go. The relevant part is mostly to the right. That's our little function right there. So you see it's named as it is in the original Go Cgo file. And yeah, it's a pretty standard C function. OK, we want to use this in, uh, in Sizen. So we need a setup pi file. And it's not so much interesting. It's, well, you just call it which library you want to use. So that's the upper line, Cgolib, Cgolib R. You tell them the extension name. So how will this extension be called when you want to import it into Python? And, well, finally you set up some infrastructure. The language is um, C++ here for reasons that will become um, clear when we go into the more complex input and output parameters. But with this and with this particular build command, you, well, get your extension and you could already use it. In Cython itself, you don't have to do too much, so you have to tell them about the header file and basically define or declare your function. And then you can write a very short wrapper function that just tells them that you want to have a function that is available in Python, cpdef, not only in C. You define um, the variables with parameters and you call it. And then you can import this particular module and do an addition in Python which is most likely the most complex way to do an addition possible, but there it is. Okay, now, so far we can define functions, but we don't really have state. So everything that we want Go to work with needs to go in as a parameter and out as a result. Um, I earlier said that I wanted to have the object model available. So what I want to do is just basically initialize this object, which for my Go app would be the application state, maybe the file system where I I'm, I'm look for the files that I want to search. And I want to um, call methods on that. The reason for that is that I don't want to copy all the data that I could potentially need from the Go world into the Python world. So I need some way to make a Go type with its methods available in Python. And then I have to ask myself, how can I accomplish that? So how would it most likely look like? 
So in Go, I have a user-defined type with methods. It's in Python, slash size is an extension type. I have methods on both sides, so that's fine. Um, in Go, I don't really have constructors as such. I have functions that return my values. Okay, that's, I have factory functions and constructors in Python so far, so good. Then things get slightly more, let's say, creative. I have to think about how do I actually get rid of my um, objects when I don't use them anymore. In Go, I have a garbage collector that takes care of that for me. Of course, you can use it wrong, but it's mostly, well, it is automatic unless you make something, uh, you do a mistake. In Python, it's usually the same. So I do have my reference counting management, um, memory management. However, I have the C layer in between, and I have to think, and so how do I tell Go that the Python system needs an object or doesn't need an object anymore? So that's something that we'll have to think about. There is some language feature difference. So Go usually uses error result values. So you have an additional um, output parameter or result parameter. Basically like in Python, if you were to return your result and then it's a tuple, a boolean or another error value, that can be mapped. And there are some features that are quite unique to Go, but that I have ignored for now, specifically interfaces and channels. So for now, it's what the Python system sees is just plain odd objects with methods on them. Okay. Now, let's look at the first object that we want to work with. This is not just, well, for demonstration purposes, we have a person. A person has a name, an age, and hopefully many friends. And for now, we just want to be able to create persons. And we want to get all the information that they could potentially have. So we want to get their age, their first name, their last name, and their string, which is mostly just concat first name, last name, name. So it's basically the double under string function in Python. OK, we want to work with that. Differences, what do we see? So first of all, now we first have a function that does not return just an integer, but a reference to an object. So here it's a pointer. And this needs to ex be expressed somehow. And well, the other thing is we have a string as a return value. It's slightly more complex, but we'll have to see. Yeah. So what can we do? If this were, for example, C++, you could just expose a pointer to your C++ object in Sison, or therefore in Python. It would be your job to ensure that the lifetime management works, but you could just look at the memory. In Go, you cannot, not really. So there are pointer passing roles. There are very limited circumstances where you can return a Go pointer to a C program. And for practical purposes, rather do not do it at all. So we need some way around that. On the other hand, we need to make sure that as long as our Python program uses an object, this object is kept in Go. And if at some point in time we want to get rid of this object, the Go runtime is free to garbage collect it. And in order to do that, we don't have this direct access. But what I came up with after some Googling around and reading some examples is basically to have some kind of proxy for this pointer which means that I have one central object store, I usually use them um, per object type, where I map the pointer to an integer, basically just the handle, and back. So every once, once a while that I want to surface an object and make it available to Python, I give this object, ask my system for an integer handle, and pass this integer handle. And the other way around. Every time I want to call this object, I take the integer handle, get the original pointer, call the message, and continue. It's not complex. The API for the thing looks like this. So it's basically just two mappings, one in each direction. Counter that tells me what the next handle should be. Hopefully I don't run out of 64-bit um, numbers quite so soon. And then a mutex to protect this in case there are multiple threads accessing it. So this helps two problems. First of all, I don't have to share my pointers. Good. 
I have another identifier for my object. And also, as long as this Go map holds the pointer, the garbage collector will not connect it. So what um, can I do with it? I have just one function that when I call it, takes a person pointer and returns an identifier. So either a new one, or if the object is already known, the existing one. I have another one that goes the other way around. So for my handle, give me the object back. And I can also remove it, which just removes them from both maps, and in its own time, the garbage collector will get rid of it. So in Seago, the same pattern that you saw earlier. So first of all, I have some input parameters, and I had to break the line so it doesn't get so long, but I pass in the C versions of the parameters I have before, so two strings. You're just plain old char pointers, so null terminated strings, and just one number. I convert them into their um, Go version. I call my Go function, I get an object back. This calls it's an object point. Uh, it's a pointer to a person object. Oh, in Go terms, a struct. And then I get an ID for that, convert the ID, and give the ID back. Okay, I have a new object. Destructor is well. It's not really the right word because it's not deterministic, but it's basically a, you are free to dispose of that in some point in the future, and it just drops it from the map. Now, just one way to call a method. So I wanted to call the person first name method. You might remember this method does not take any parameters, so the only parameter it takes is in Python terms self, the object. That would be the object ID here. So I take the object ID. I convert the object ID to back to the struct pointer. I actually call the method, the um, var result line. Once again, much boilerplate, not too much actual work. And once this is done, I can um, get the C string, or I can get um, the first name as a result. I can convert it to a C sharp pointer. The C string a function comes with C go, so that's one of the provided one. And I can pass it back. I have to be careful because now, since I'm in C land, I have to be responsible with my memory management and this C sharp. Um, pointer is allocated, so it needs to be freed most likely by the, um, well, future owner who gets his string back. See, so you go then in the build process, generate some headers again, and I can use these header in Sison, so Sison knows my um, C library. And then I can write an extension class, so a cdef class, to use it all. Now, let's start in the middle, in the cinit function. The um, size and cinit function is basically used before init. And you can also use it to allocate memory and to do all low-level stuff that you want, might want to use. For all practical terms, it's basically the init. So I build my object here. My object is only the handle. It does not really have much in terms of member data because everything that I want to use lives in the Go world. Everything that every member that I want to access needs to have a getter setter and accessor function because it keeps things nice and simple. You could design it differently, but for my purposes it works quite well. Um, I have to think about one other thing. Now, if you call this function with first name, last name, and age, what happens is that I request a new person from Seago. So I call the function that provides me with a new function. What could happen, and we'll see this um, later on, is that I have already a handle, so the integer, or rather the long, that identifies the object, and I want just the um, C Python wrapper for it. So I also, if I just handle this object ID in, I need to do something slightly different. There's also one additional issue in terms of ownership. So let's say we will have 
and we'll see this later, we have a function that returns all the friends for a person. So in our terms, it returns a couple of object IDs. If I see this object ID, do I create a new size and wrapper class or do I reuse an existing one? You could, in principle, re um, create a new one. However, the problem is if this one drops, it would call its dialog function and it would tell Golang that it, we don't need the object anymore. So in, to make things simple, the idea here is just to see this object ID is already known. If you want to use a size and wrapper for this particular ID, we use an existing one, so we only have one. And that's why we have this known dict up there and why we use weak ref uh, while I use weak references just to be able to check whether I already know an object without forcing the object to stay in memory. I don't think that's the most elegant solution, so most likely this will at some point in time wander down one level and be handled in C++, but for now it's, well, the solution I came up with. And it's quite simple really, and, well, it's long, but it doesn't really happen much. So I get my Python parameters for the constructor, convert them into something that Seago understands, chart pointers again, pass them into the Seago call, Seago will then turn them into Go, and down in <coughs> the Go world, we'll have a new object, or can get rid of it. The actual working function, so to get the first name, is surprisingly short. So I call the Seago function with my object ID. I get a char pointer back, I convert this char pointer to a Python string, so to Unicode, using this nice example function from um, Sison. And now I have a, well, Sison object. Okay, and we can use it, and we can take a breath. So this has been most likely been quite a lot of code at once. So just to iterate, we have something in Goland. If we wanted to use it in Go, we could most likely just use a pointer. We can't pass this pointer all the way to Python, so we need to map the pointer to an ID. We use this ID in Python, and this ID says everything that, well, if you wanted to do something with this object, I need the object ID, okay, it's basically self. We need to map this all through Cgo. Cgo is basically C in terms of API. So I have to map everything that I have either in Go for Python or in Python for Go into something in C. This is nice for integers. For strings, we already saw that I need um, a char or a char pointer that needs to be allocated, that needs to be converted to Unicode back and forth. And all this to be able to create an object which then lives only in Go memory, and to use this object. So, like I said, it's slightly more complicated than you'd like to want it. The good news is that all this code can be handwritten. We'll see at the end that it's, well, possible. So, anybody has any specific questions before we go on? Because things will get worse before they get better. Okay. I have a question. Sure. So I'm not sure if it makes sense, but if you want <laughs> to implement a package with mm -hmm. an implementation with Go or Cgo and the mm -hmm. Python package itself, how does the structure would look like? That's um, the... Or maybe you will show it later. But I, I don't want to switch all the way back. So in terms of structure, you basically get this... So the package looks like a normal Sison package. So it's a dynamic library that you can load. This dynamic library happens to use the Sison file, so the PyX file, plus the header and the archive file, so the static library that Seago builds for us. So you have a dynamic library, .so file, which is a Python, which includes the archive file from Seago. And this archive file from Seago includes the whole Go runtime. So usually, even for our first little function, it would be for 
megabytes about. So from your perspective, it shouldn't make any difference whether this thing was written in C or in Golang. Once this all happens, the build process can get complicated, which is one of the reasons why I've now only tried it for, uh, on the Mac, because Cgo itself, like we said, like you said earlier, requires a simple build step, and this build step also requires some C or C++ code if things get realistic. So building it, it's not so nice. The package, once we have the binary package, is like any other size and package. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So far, we have basically passed very simple data, strings, integers. Now, we want to make our person a little bit more, well, powerful. And now we want to add friends, get their friends, and also want to get some information about their friends. So all their first names and a mapping on how many friends with which age do I have. Actually, it doesn't make much sense to use these functions. I just wanted to present how slightly more complex data structures. So for the first one, if I add a friend, I can't add a friend twice. So I need some indicator for an error. And in Golang, I return a second value, an error value. And I also return the number of friends that I currently have. So it's first challenge, how do I express errors? Second one, I return persons, which means here object pointer. So these are not primitive data types anymore. I need to build Python objects that represent each and every friend. Then I need to return a list or a slice of strings. And finally, another favorite, a map or a dict of integers to integers. And design decision time again. How can we represent that? So the first three we already saw, integers or floats or whatever are basically the same in every language. There are some things that you have to keep in mind with C, but it mostly works. Strings, painful but doable, so you have to convert from strings to pointers back to strings. Good thing is that um, Golang is also UTF-8 encoded, so you don't have to take care of that too much. Object types, we talked about it a lot, so we got the ID, and the ID is wrapped in an extension type that works. But now I have to I have a gap between my nice world in Go, where I have all these data types, and in Python, where I also have these data types. And in C, Actually, I don't have that, so I don't have really have a nice standard C list. I have arrays, but they are slightly limited, so I would at least to have to include the lengths. I don't really have a map or a hash. There are libraries that have that. And error values, so C has many different ways to express error values. There. And that gave me an excuse. This excuse was also to include C++. Now, it's slightly less insane than it sounds. The reason why I use C++ is that Sison has C++ um, support. So if I can get C++ vectors or C++ maps to Sison, I can more or less directly <coughs> use them. Also, I don't have to write my own container data types in C. So the idea is I need, I can write or can have these data structures in C++. And the only thing that I need to do is to make them, well, agreeable to CGO. CGO does not directly call C++, so I need a C API for my C++ code. I don't know whether you've always done this before, but it's, it almost always looks like this. So I tell my compiler that if it is a C++ compiler, it does, should not um, mangle the names, so it should treat them as plain C names. And since this is just a C-compatible header file, nobody needs to care that under this all these void pointers are actually vectors and maps and other things. So to keep things simple, when I've done this, I have a C API for CGO, and I have nice data types underneath. Well, and I have some extremely simple C++. So all in all, I think for this, what I do here, I have M50 lines. And all these things do is give me some basic API to push values onto vectors. So that would be our list of slices, or include values in maps, 
So I can then return a pointer to this map from the seagull to Sison, and Sison can then use them. Okay, so if you look at this, it's not too complicated. The thing, the for loop, is the most interesting um, part of it. There I use my opaque list functions, so I just get a pointer to my list. Sego doesn't need to know that what this pointer refers to, and then I call um, a function with this pointer and the information I want to add. And somehow in memory, a vector is built, and this vector is then available for Sison. Hooray. So now I can work with more complex data structures, and I didn't, didn't even have to write them myself. Errors. I think there are many, many talks about the best ways of error handling. For those in the Go community, you may have already read about try. So there are opinions. There are opinions in C++. Python is relatively straightforward. We use exceptions. Um, I, I could have done different things here. So I have could um, build a custom struct to return my return value and an error for every function that has an error. What I did here is quite simple. I just used a um, double sharp pointer as an output parameter. If an error occurred, I set it somewhere other than null with an error string. And then I use this error string in, C, um, in Sison and um, just throw an exception with this particular error. So Here's basically where this happens. Here it assigns a pointer if I get an error value. So I check for error. If it is there, build an error string. And then I can use this in Python. And if it's not null, so if there is an error, then I throw an exception. It's not the most elegant way to do it because I lose many of the potential in, um, information that an error value in Go might have. It's an interface, so it could have had much more information but it at least lets me know what roughly went wrong. Yeah, and it looks like that. So I create my persons again. I add some friends. I get some friends counts by age. So somewhere under the lid, a map is constructed, passed up to Sison, and Sison can work with this map. And when I try to add a friend that is already known, I get an exception. Yoo-hoo. Okay, now you have to be slight, you have to be strong. Because this is the, co the t um, part of the talk where I was sitting yesterday when I went over it again and just, okay, how was this supposed to work again? So, starting with the design, we want a callback. I want to be able to have a function for my person where I pass in one function that tells me based on the age of the person if I should return this person. So maybe I just want to have everybody been um, under 16 or everybody whose age is in a certain age range. I want a function. It looks like that. So I pass the function into a Go function. I just check for every friend whether it matches this function. If yes, I include it and return it. If not, then not. And this led me to the following thought process. We want Python code. So I want to write this function in Python, not in Go, not in C. We need to somehow get this into the C Go layer. C Go does not know Python code. However, so what it does know are function pointers. Now, Sison can define a C function, and if I can define a C function, I get a function pointer. Okay, so I have a way to get my function pointer. Sison to the rescue can also execute Python code within these functions. So now I have a function pointer to something that executes Python. Good. And now I have to call this function pointer in Cgo. Just one more step. Cgo cannot directly call function pointers, so I need a helper function in C that calls this, um, the function pointer that in turn goes to the Sison function that has a co Python code. So it's slightly complicated. Um, it works somehow. It, it's, thank you. So just to give you some time for questions, because truth has been told, it's quite a lot. We need some C code 
to represent our function pointer and the helper function. And we have um, <coughs> just these um, Cgo things. Cgo has, um, in the Cgo function, I have a local function definition, the function thing in the middle, which actually is a closure around the function pointer and then calls it. So I'm now into C land and I can call the function pointer with our underlying in Python code. In Cyton, I can just take my function, the object fun, I can assign it to a global variable. I'm not happy about it either. There is an alternative, but it's even more complicated, so it's for later. And then I can call this global function down in the filter by h thing, and I can return whether it matched or not. And surprise, surprise, this actually works. So we have this rather senseless lambda, which checks if the person is um, older than 10 and if the name is divided by two. And we get just one of our four friends back and, well, it works. <sighs> You're there. Congratulations. So, was it worth it? Yes, um, to a degree. So, it's 130 lines of Golang. Mostly because I wrote quite long. It's quite a lot more of C Go. There's a little bit C and a little bit C++ and 200 lines of sight. So if I had to do this for every object by hand, it's doable because the code is very, well, it's always the same. Convert your functions, convert your um, results, um, copy-paste the function name into different files. It's not too bad. My hope ultimately is to generate that. So the nice thing about Go is it has a parser module, so it's quite easy to have a nice view about your Go code. It's a simple language, so you don't have to do, well, you don't have to account for C++ macros and stuff like that. So my idea would basically to, is to write a code generator. So that's not so much a problem. Another one is a slight challenge. I just wanted to benchmark it, and that's just a benchmark. I built a couple of persons, so in this example I built 4,000 persons. Each person gets assigned up about 50 friends. Um, and then I want to find the persons that have the most friends. So I take all these 5,000 persons, iterate over them, and just count how, many, how often the names um, show up. I do this in, by using the term, the person's name as a string. So I just take this, let's say, Jake B 43 as um, a key in a counter, and I count over them. And I wrote this in three different versions. Version one, where I call this um, the string function. So one function for every person that gives me the whole string. Version two, where I get all three attributes on their own. And finally, one version where I do everything in Go. Now the surprising thing is Python is faster by quite a bit. So if I do everything in Go, Go is faster, OK. But if I, do the, if I use the accessor calls, then Go wins, uh, then Python wins. And why is that? Because every call from Python to Go have a significant overhead. So if you compare just those two, you see that the string function that gives me the complete person string is about eight, ten times slower in Go. It's worse for the first name function that does less. So I have quite a bit of overhead to when I call this function call, go through all these layers. So I convert my object ID to a pointer, I call something on the pointer, the Go runtime has to make sure that all the stacks are aligned. And this is something that is, well, I'm not quite happy with me that at the moment. So, good news is things work. Bad news is performance is still not where I would like um, to have it. So maybe message Q and C or something like that might help. But well, ultimately, Go and Python go together. Thanks. And, <laughs> and one question. Thank you, Stefan. Maybe we. Thank you. Uh, maybe we have time for one question, but should be a fast question. If not, you can reach Stefan later on. No question, so give a big to give a give a thank you to Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you.